Ladies and gentlemen, we are back. Welcome to part two of the darkest football iceberg. I just want to say thank you so much for the love and support on part one or the original episode. I felt like a part two is needed because there are so many football stories that I missed out on. I really, really felt like a part two was needed. Tell me down below what football stories would you like me to cover next and what do you think? of this video. I really do enjoy the icebergs, I really like bringing information that I never knew going into this and hopefully you don't too. As just a reminder of what icebergs entails, it's been a, a trend on YouTube for quite a while now. The structure of the video goes as follows. When you see an iceberg, you may only see the tip, however underneath it goes way deeper and way darker than what you may see at the surface because there are so many unknown stories I'm gonna rank it by the most tame stories in football and the deeper you go the more sinister the more dark they get if you have not seen part one then please do because I really really loved making that video and I hope that you guys find the same enjoyment in this video too if you guys are new then please do subscribe to the channel it means the world as by checking my recent analytics only 73.5 percent of you are not subscribed to the channel who has seen my recent videos if you're new then please do smash a like button the last video got i think 10,000 likes which is nuts so thank you so much for that if you would like to follow up let's try to hit a much more reasonable 3,000 likes and with that said let's get straight into the video i hope you guys do enjoy and let's go Sponsor time. Being online is quite hard, and at times you feel that you're left out. For example, I live in Poland, therefore I get location locked from quite a lot of content online, and that includes the Premier League. And as you can see on Sky Sports Premier League, there should be a ton of content here from the United game, from all highlights, and even the punditry, commentary, everything. A lot of content should be here. But it's not, because I am location locked. Even if I try to work around it and get onto the video by having a link, I still can't see it as it will say this, video unavailable, I can't view it in my country. Today's video has been brought to you by Surfshark, the best VPN on the market and the safest. I get to watch the football highlights and also live football by using Surfshark VPN. Having a VPN on your devices is absolutely necessary nowadays. Not only to obtain locked footage like what I'm going to show you, but also to, just to keep yourself safe and private online. This is a Surfshark application and it is incredibly easy to use. So just simply go and type up United Kingdom and there's multiple different servers you can pick. So go and pick Manchester and now we are protected. So by opening up Surfshark and then connecting to the UK server, and if I click F3 and refresh my page, lo and behold, there is a ton of content here that I have missed out on. Not just the highlights, but also from Monday Night Football, Super Sunday Analysis, a ton of content here that I have missed out on. Commentaries, punditry that I were not able to obtain. And to show you a sample, this video I was location locked from, if I go and refresh my page and... Wow, all of a sudden, I can now watch the football. Sorry, United fans, if this does remind you. So if this does interest you, then link will be down below at the top of the description and make sure to use code VISA at checkout to get 83% off your order, plus also free three months. It's an unbelievable deal and a VPN is absolutely necessary nowadays to keep you safe online. So link is down below and thank you yourself, Shop VPN, for sponsoring today's video. The tip of the iceberg. Claypool versus Vittoriano Arenas. In the year of 2011, there was a very interesting match in the Argentinian fifth tier. Now, typically when one team gets a red card, it is quite a fateful error and typically ends up costing the team. However, what happens when 36 people gets red carded? Located in Buenos Aires, 
it was seen as a local derby. And as predicted, Challengers was flying in from minute one. In the first 10 minutes, a scuffle already occurred between two players and a red card was already given to the Victoriano striker. Claypole took the lead 1-0 after a free kick. Soon after, an altercation between the player from Victoriano's and a coach sparked another melee. The referee pulled out another red card, which, to the player in question, responded with fury, who practically pulled the gate that separated to the pitch and the dressing room off its hinges. Claypole went on to score again and make it 2-0. Tensions was at boiling point. Yet again, another fight then broke out on the centre circle, involving players, subs and coaches from both sides. The police was called and the game was called off. The referee, despite not being able to brandish his red cards on the pitch, after the chaos was concluded, he walked into each locker room, giving each player a red card straight afterwards. I'll be honest, he has balls doing that. A total of 36 football players and coaches were shown red cards, which is a record of the most red cards in football history. Sunderland v Derby 1894. One of the most unique footballing stories in history. In the 1894-95 football season, a match was played between Sunderland and Derby County. However, this was a bit different. Typically with football, as we all know, there is two halves one 45 minute half followed by another 45 minute half well in this one game in football history this game is termed as the game of three halves derby traveled to sunderland on the 1st of september for the new round fixture of the first division season but the referee at the time t kirkham was running late and the game started with a replacement referee called john conqueror after 45 minutes was played sunderland was leading 3-0 however at half time kirkham the original referee that was running late arrived and made the incredible decision to ask Derby if they wanted to play the game again from scratch. Derby accepted, meaning that the 45 minutes played beforehand was null and void. Two more halves followed, therefore being three halves of football being played. But unfortunately for Derby County, their decision to start the match again did not help. They conceded three goals in the first half, but technically second half, and then five goals in the second slash third half and lost the game 8-0, but technically was 11-0, the one and only time that three halves was played in a match in football history. So next time you're at your pub quiz and this does come up, thank me later. Carlos Kaiser. If you ask most children what do you want to be when they grow up, the majority will say they want to be a footballer. We all grow up playing football and at a certain stage realise that we have a obvious lack of athletic abilities to reach the top level. Most of us realise that we can't be a footballer and that's okay and we move on. However, there's some footballers makes that dream a reality by any means necessary. The story of Carlos Kaiser is incredibly unique. Carlos Kaiser, or full name Carlos Enrique Raposo, he was a Brazilian pro footballer that played for many top ranked Brazilian football teams and, well I say play, he never played an official game in his entire 12 year long career. What Carlos Kaiser lacked in athletic ability, he more than made up in social skills, befriending a number of high profile players at various clubs as well as local journalists, all of whom he used as a network to facilitate transfers and build up his image without ever playing a single football match. Carlos typically signed short term deals and stated at the beginning of each contract that he needed to work on his fitness before being match ready. He would always fake a hamstring injury to hide his poor football skills and blamed his injuries for the reason why he can't perform. And if teams wanted to investigate further, he had dentists or local doctors that was able to confirm his illness and cover his back, despite it not being true. Some interesting ways of how he kept this going was that the journalists that he befriended, they were able to create fake articles in newspapers that validated him being a footballer. One article claimed that he played so well at Puebla in Mexico that he was invited to become a Mexican citizen, while another one he claimed to be the top goal scorer for French team Gazalek Ayaccio, funny how they've come up again since my recent research on them, where he allegedly played for eight seasons. He used photos of him wearing a Ayaccio jersey that his friend gave him and a fake identification card. If this story does interest you, then there is a full documentary on Kaiser called Kaiser, the greatest footballer to never play football, or known as football's biggest con man, who wanted the footballer's lifestyle but never actually wanted to play football. And for 12 years, it worked. Playing for teams such as Vasco da Gama, Independiente, Flamenze and Flamengo and never actually played an official game 
for any of them. Andrew Durante. The story of Andrew Durante is one that I've never heard of and I'm surprised I never have. This story dates all the way back in 1999. The 17-year-old Andrew Durante was playing in a trial game in Sydney. The match went on like any other, until at one stage, the player Andrew Durante fell down. Initially, he thought someone had thrown a rock at him after being subbed from the field during the trial match for Sydney Olympic Reserves team. When walking over to the subs bench, one of his teammates noticed bloodstains on his shirt. His dad lifted up his shirt and they noticed blood dripping down from his chest. And at that moment, he realized that his 17 year old son was shot. A frenzy kicked off, police were called and the ambulance as well. The game called off immediately and everyone ran to the changing rooms for safety. He was shot by a 22 caliber rifle during the trial game. However, luckily escaped without any serious injuries due to the location that he was shot. The angle that he was shot at saved his life because if it was at any other angle, straight on or the opposite side, he would have died most likely. Interestingly, Andrew Durante is actually one of the greatest A-League footballers in the modern era and was a much loved captain for the Wellington Phoenix. An investigation at the time was being held, however sadly police never found the perpetrator. However, another shooting was reported at a nearby golf course earlier that day. As quoted, there was probably some idiot up there shooting from his house or up on the street taking random pop shots at people. I remember the players saying that they heard things whistling past their heads but they didn't know what it was. I hope that this doesn't give you too much anxiety the next time you play football. The Surface Rafe Rovers 1923 The small town club of Rafe Rovers finished third place in a 1922-23 season behind Rangers and champion Celtic. Obviously, it's Scotland. As a reward of their accomplishments, they decided at the end of the season to go on a tour of the Canary Islands. 13 players and 5 officials boarded the Highland Lock at Tilbury Docks. They all went aboard the ship and expected a nice, lovely, relaxing cruise around the Canary Islands. The voyage went smoothly. Until it didn't. Throughout the night, wild, stormy waves buffeted the ship and the ship eventually struck the rocks off the bleak rocky coast of northwest Spain. It was 6.30 in the morning and Rafe Rovers became the first football club in history to become shipwrecked. For many hours and even days they walked through difficult conditions while many of the players and officials were dressed only in pajamas and dressing gowns as they escaped the ship in the middle of the night. However, fortunately they reached the seaport of Vigo and were able to find some organizations in the area. With help, they managed to locate the ship that they escaped from and were able to get back to safety. So tell me, after you've just been shipwrecked, would you do number one? cut your losses and just go straight back home instantly, or number two, board another ship and complete your tour around the Canary Islands. They took their tour around the Canary Islands. Even a shipwreck does not stop the Scots having a buggy apparently. Marseille Scandal 1993 In the summer of 1993, French football was being held into jeopardy, and most specifically, the fingers were being pointed at Marseille. On the 20th of May 1993, a match between Valenciennes and Marseille took place, the last match of the Ligue 1 season. However, most importantly, one week later was the Champions League final between Marseille and AC Milan. To add context, in the 1991 European Cup final, Marseille lost to Red Star Belgrade and they blamed the fact that two players in their team became unavailable and the Marseille president, Bernard Tapie, did not want to repeat the same fate. So Marseille president Bernard Tapie and general manager Jean-Pierre Bernice contacted Valencia's players who asked them to underperform in that match so that Marseille could stay fresher for the Champions League final. Baru Chaga and Robert accepted the bribe. However, Glassman refused to partake in the bribe and was the one who publicly revealed the scandal. Later on, Glassman was awarded the 1995 FIFA Fair Play Award for refusing to partake in the bribe. Marseille went on to win the game 1-0. However, due to the scandal being public, the scandal led to a league title being taken away and stripped from Marseille and was given to PSG. However, they declined to take the title, so therefore the 1992-93 league title in Ligue 1 was 
seen as unclassified for a winner. Marseille went on to win the Champions League final. Marseille were relegated to Division 2 the following season. Both chairman and general manager were sent to prison, but the 1993 Champions League trophy still is held by Marseille. To this day. Zaire 1974. I'm sure that at one stage in your life you've seen this particular comedic moment at the 1974 World Cup where Brazil played Zaire, who was an African nation at the time, who later would proceed to become the Democratic Republic of Congo, labelled to be a bizarre moment of African ignorance by commentator John Motson. As Brazil star men, Rivellino and Jorginho was over the ball for the free kick and the defender broke free of the Zaire wall and booted the ball away as far as he could, receiving a yellow card. As many people brush it off as simple ignorance for not knowing the rules of the game and claiming that Zed did not know the rules of football, which was seen as highly disrespectful, there's a darker story to it. At the time, Zed was under the rule of fierce dictator Mobutu Sese Seko, who was making big changes in the country. He changed the name from Congo to Zed in 1971 and was heavily invested in football in his homeland and aggressively went on and building a dominant side. They qualified for the 90s 1974 World Cup and had a group with Scotland, Yugoslavia and Brazil. They went on to lose to a Kenny Dalglish Scottish side only 2-0 and was seen to be an okay defeat in the grand scheme of things. However, the next game against Yugoslavia was much, much worse. A World Cup record 9-0 defeat. And dictator Mobuto was furious. Such was his anger that he ordered several of the personal bodyguards to go over to Germany and threaten the national team, telling the squad that if they lost by more than three goals, to the reigning world champions Brazil, then they would not be allowed back in the country. So comes the second half, and Zé are 2 0 down to Brazil, and the free kick moment took place. Alunga booted the ball away as far as he could during that free kick as an attempt to run the clock down. Zé went on to lose the game 3 0, and only a few were allowed to return home, albeit in disgrace. Several players of that team died in poverty. Malamba Ndai was forced to beg in South Africa and Ikofa Mbungu was working as a taxi driver. Ilunga, the tragic hero of this piece, sad sadly died in 2015 at the age of 66. One strange part of history where a dictator controlled everything to do with the country and its sport. Barbosa 1950. The 1950 World Cup final. The host nation Brazil was in the final and were up against a giant at the time, Uruguay. If you speak to Brazilians of a certain age group, they look back on that final as the fateful final, or the word in Portuguese, fatizio. The Brazilians built the Maracanã purposely for this World Cup. Moassa Barbosa was the goalkeeper for the Brazil national team. Brazil scored the first goal in the final by a goal in the second half by Friatza. However, Uruguay came back with a goal from Chiafino to equalise past Barbosa. And 13 minutes later, Giga of Uruguay ran down the line again. At 4.33 on the 16th of July 1950, the worst moment in his career. As Giga ran down the line and Bob Bolsa anticipated a cross. However, as the ball came in, the ball went to the near post and caught Bob Bolsa off guard. It was a poor goal to concede. Brazilians were distraught and wanted someone to blame. And Bob Bolsa was the scapegoat that was used to be the man that cost Brazil the World Cup. For the rest of Bob Bolsa's life following this event, this one single moment haunted him. It was reported that people spat on him on the street on multiple occasions, abused him day to day for being the man that made Brazil cry. He never played for Brazil again and was denied coaching jobs and really any jobs in football after he retired. He even visited the Brazilian national team to wish them well. However, turning up to the training ground, he was denied entry as the staff at the time feared bad luck from Barbosa and refused him to enter the grounds. As the staff at the time feared bad luck from Barbosa and refused him to enter the grounds. Multiple years later, Barbosa invited a few friends who wanted to have a barbecue. They noticed on the fire that it had some strange logs in it and they were in really strange shapes. And that is because the week before, Barbosa had been presented with the Maracanã goalpost from that fateful day, he went on to chop up and burn the goalpost with his friends. Quoted, the steak I cut that day was the best steak I ever tasted. 
a quote from a friend saying, I'm not guilty. There was 11 of us. In Brazil, the most you get for any crime is 30 years. For 50 years, I've been paying a crime that I did not commit. Even a criminal, when he has paid his debt, is forgiven. But I have never been forgiven. The Body Sandor Suks. Sandor Suks was a Hungarian footballer in the 1950s and was a part of the famous Hungarian teams at the time. However, may not be as famous as the likes of Fenech Puskas. Sandor Suks holds a unique, if not somewhat morbid place in Hungarian football history. He was a great defender and after World War II won three successive league titles with Ujpest. In 1948, he met a woman called Ezzi Kovacs, who was an up-and-coming jazz singer. Suks and Kovacs fell madly in love with each other, and despite both being married at a time, the authorities frowned upon such behaviour, and to avoid a major scandal, Suks was dropped from the national team. The Hungarian secret police got involved and went out to abandon the affair, or Suks and Kovacs would face the consequences. Quote, even his footballer's legs cannot help him escape. Suks had some interest from the Italian club Torino and the duo saw this as the opportunity to escape the country. They saw this as their one and only chance to be together. They enlist the help of a smuggler. Hungary at the time was controlled by the Soviet Union. The couple began their journey together with their handler entrusted to smuggle them out of the country. Shortly after passing through a checkpoint near the Austrian border, the trio was stopped by the Hungarian secret police officers, at which point the smuggler revealed himself to be an agent and handed the couple over to the authorities. Sandor Suks and Ezzi Kovacs were taken to the Terror Haza, other known as the House of Terror, which was the headquarters of the Hungarian secret police in Budapest, where they were tortured and interrogated before being charged for attempted illegal border crossing and high treason. Suks was tried in court, which was essentially a short trial with no hope of getting any success from it and was found guilty of all charges and sentenced to death by hanging. His lover Kovacs begged Suks to plead the court for mercy which he refused stating that he would rather die than live his life apart from her. On the 4th of June 1951 Suks was executed by the Hungarian state. The crime of falling in love with a woman and trying to escape the strict communist regime, a dark cloud that still hovers Hungarian football. Robert Enker. Robert Enker was a German goalkeeper in the 90s and 2000s, playing for many teams like Barcelona, Benfica, and became a mainstay at Hanover 96. In 2006, Robert Enker and his wife Teresa Reim had a daughter called Laura, who was born with a heart birth defect and sadly passed away in 2006 and was suffering with depression for six years until the 10th of November 2009 at the age of 32 Robert Enker died standing in front of a regional express train at a level crossing in Germany. The police confirmed an ought was discovered but did not publicize the details. His depression was lasting for six years and was being treated by a psychiatrist and the death of his daughter he was never able to recover from. Enke was on the cusp of being the main number one for the German national team. At the time, he was a team captain for Hanover, which eventually became a burden for his last season. He often felt the need to be different things to different people and could not deal with the pressure. The doubt over the German number one position at the 2010 World Cup as he had competition with the likes of Adler, Neuer and Heidebrand, coupled with the tougher aspects of captaincy, conspired to take the toll on Enker. Before his death, a support system was being created by his wife and players at Hanover was actively keeping an eye on Enker and routinely encouraging him in training. Looking back on his last game for the 2-2 draw between Hanover and Hamburg, there was a complete lack of expression and emotion. The death of Robert Enker created an opportunity to normalise talking about depression with footballers in the modern game and in response created much more open support systems to prevent a situation like this happening ever again. Barry 
Benel. Former crew defender Annie Woodward alleged in an interview with The Guardian that he was a victim of child sexual abuse by former football coach Barry Benel in the 1980s. This one interview by Andy Woodward created a storm in the following weeks and months following a investigation from late 2016 through to 2019. The investigation known as the UK football sexual abuse scandal going into former coaches and scouts in the 1970s, 80s and 90s taking advantage of their situation and sexually abused footballers. Large allegations was being held to Barry Burnell, George Ormond, Eddie Heath and Bob Higgins. Throughout this investigation, the FA, the SFA, multiple football clubs and 20 UK police forces and at the end of the investigation, it has been believed that there was 849 alleged victims with 2,807 incidents involving 340 different clubs throughout the UK. By the end of 2021, 16 men had been charged for historical sexual abuse offences, 15 of whom were tried, 14 were convicted. This investigation led to a can of worms being opened and looking at potentially an institutional cover-up or even a paedophile ring operating within football. Of the 14 that were convicted, Barry Burnell was by far the most haunting. Hundreds of people's lives were haunted or even destroyed by the hands of these people and due to the lack of safeguarding that was not held at multiple football clubs and forever will be a dent in English and Scottish football. The Darkness Bruno Fernandes de Sousa In 2010, a horrific crime took place where Bruno Fernandes de Sousa who was the goalkeeper for the biggest team in Brazil, Flamengo. He was sentenced to prison for 22 years after murdering his partner, Elisa Samuel Dio. In 2009, Samuel Dio told him that she was pregnant with his child and refused to have an abortion. They broke up and she later gave birth, naming her child Bruninho. However, she sued Bruno for not supporting her child, as the goalkeeper refused to accept him as his son. Soon after, she disappeared. The child, alive, was discovered with Bruno's associates in a slum. According to the police, Bruno killed his partner as an act of revenge. Elisa Samudio's body was chopped up and some parts were buried under concrete and other parts were fed to his dogs. In 2013, he was sentenced for 22 years. However, in February 2017, Bruno Fernandes de Sousa was released under an amnesty. A utterly tragic tale. Alex Villaplane. Alex Villaplane was a footballer for France in the 1930s and even captain France in their first ever match in the World Cup finals over a 4 1 win over Mexico in 1930. He was known for his aggressive attitude on the pitch and known for his tough tackling and short fused temper. For example, when Nice snapped up for the plane, they soon regretted it. Several times he was fined for missing training and when he played, he looked unfit and was uninterested. And in 1935, five years later after playing in the World Cup for France and captaining them, he was lost in football. However, of course, in June 1940, Paris fell to Nazi Germany. The occupation of Paris spelt doom and despair to many, but for some, it spawned new opportunities. The French Gestapole was formed, and Alex Villaplane became part of it. His life and career spiraled out of control. Greed and he sought criminality to cover the lost finances that he'd grown accustomed to in football. Villaplane was not interested in the moral or political ramifications of his actions just the paychecks. His power and cruelty rose in equal measure, culminating in the massacre in Musidan in 1944. At Musidan, 52 inhabitants were killed by Villaplane. This included men, women and children not involved in the French resistance or even fighting at the time. Villaplane hit the heights of pure evil 
and continued to escalate his violence and corruptness. He was now seeking to kill his own people, fighting to restore the country that had given him everything. In August 1944, France were liberated by the Allied forces and Villaplane was captured alongside the French Gestapo. The tragic decline of a man who once captained his country of France, becoming a true beacon of potential future for the nation, wasting his talent and becoming corrupt only 10 years later. Villaplane, alongside other members of the French Gestapo, was executed at gunpoint on Boxing Day 1944. Eddie Hamill, where he and his family lost their lives. The Abyss. Stairway 13. On the 2nd of January, 1971, a cold and foggy night took place at Ibrox Stadium between the old fur match of Rangers v Celtic. I brought stadium this night, witnessed one of the worst sporting events at the time, as 66 people lost their lives in a devastating crush. I brought at the time was often seeing crowds of around 100,000, and despite the growth of capacity, there was very few safety procedures in place to deal with the huge numbers at the time. The game was no nil to the end moments of the game, until Celtic's Jimmy Johnston scored with a header and appeared to have won the game for the hoops. Many Rangers fans, at the sight of the goal going in, started to leave the stadium. Many going down the turnstiles and leaving the exits, going down the steps. However, Rangers' reply was instant, going straight up the other end and winning a free kick before Cullenstein somehow packed home an equaliser in the most dramatic fashion, with those who had already left totally oblivious to what was happening inside the ground. Reports suggested that a huge crowd all tried to exit the ground at the final whistle, down the steep and narrow stairway 13, the very same staircase where two fans had died two years earlier. A number of people said to have lost their footing, causing hundreds of people to fall on top of each other. As people tumbled down the concrete steps, a toxic crush ensued, and in a matter of seconds, the breath was literally being squeezed from 66 people, with over 200 others suffering terrible injuries. Casualties ranged in the age of 8 to 45 years of age, with the majorities being in their teens or 20s. Zambia, 1993. On the 27th of April, 1993, a flight carrying most of the Zambian national football team to a 1994 FIFA World Cup qualifier against Senegal took place. Prior to the flight, a DHC-5 Buffalo transport aircraft had been out of service for five months prior to the flight, only to be back in use again only a few days before the fateful flight. Prior to the departure for Senegal, checks revealed a number of defects in the engine, carbon particles in oil filters, disconnected cables, and trace of heating. However, the flight went ahead as scheduled. For the flight from Zambia to Senegal, they had to make three refueling stops, first in Brazzaville in Congo, the second in Libreville in Gabon, and the third Abidjan in Ivory Coast. At the first stop in Brazzaville, engine problems were already noted. Despite this, the flight continued, and a few minutes after taking off from the second stop in Libreville, the left engine caught fire and failed. The pilot then mistakenly shut down the right engine, causing the plane to lose all power and fell into the water 500 meters offshore into the Atlantic Ocean. An investigation found that pilot fatigue and a faulty warning light contributed to the accident. All 30 passengers and crew, including 18 players, as well as the national team coach and support staff, died in the accident. The members of the national team that perished in the crash, were buried in what has become known as Heroes Acre, just outside the Independence Stadium in Lusaka. A new side was quickly assembled. And to end on a good note, in 2012, Zambia won the Africa Cup of Nations in Libreville, only a few hundred meters inland from the crash site. The victory was dedicated to the ones that lost their lives in the tragic event. Accra Sports Stadium. On May the 9th, 
2001, a grave disaster took place in Accra, Ghana. In a match between Ghana's two more successful football teams, Accra Hearts of Orc and Asante Kotoko. Asante Kotoko was 1-0 up, however Accra scored two late goals and the referee blew full time, resulting in Asante Kotoko fans throwing plastic seats and bottles onto the pitch. The police responded by firing tear gas into the crowd. A great panic and stampede ensued as fans tried to escape from the gas. While trying to escape, the gates were locked and the stadium's compromise design left a bottleneck with fewer exits than originally planned. The stadium was labeled a death trap. After an hour long ordeal, this resulted in 126 deaths. Six police officers were charged with 127 counts of manslaughter. Ghana's president called for three days of mourning and a bronze statue was erected outside the stadium of a fan carrying another fan to safety. Fans who attend matches at the stadium now to this day chant never again to remind themselves of this day. So there you have it lads, that is part two of the darkest football iceberg and the crazy part is there is so much that I can add in this video but I simply cannot fit it all in. What should I put in my next iceberg video and tell me if you guys do enjoy the series. I really do find it interesting sharing these unknown stories with you guys. I do truly appreciate you guys being here. If you guys do enjoy then please do subscribe to the channel and also hit that like button too. Let's try to hit 3,000 likes. And with that said, I'll see you guys next time for another video. And thank you for your time.